All right, here we go. Phil Lamar, welcome to Vlad TV. Thanks, Vlad. How you doing, man? Big, big fan of, of what you've been doing over the last few decades, actually. <laughs> you know, well, from, that means you're old. I'm old. I'm eternally young, but you old. <laughs> I'm old. I'm old. From uh, Pulp Fiction right. to Mad TV yeah, to the, the hundreds of voices that you did in, <laughs> in various uh, cartoons. Yeah, yeah. It so, adds up. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's start in the beginning. You grew up in L.A. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. born and raised. Born and raised. Did you know you wanted to get into acting back then as a kid? Uh, no, no. I mean, I did plays and stuff, mm -hmm. um, and nobody in my family is in show business. Okay. You know, everybody thinks everybody in L.A. is in show business. It's like, no, no, there's a whole <laughs> lot of other jobs here. I just was a little bookworm, you know, as a nerd, and then I started doing, a, you know, my school did a play based on a book that I loved. So I, I auditioned because I liked the book, mm -hmm. not because I wanted to be in a play. <laughs> right. And then it just bit me. You know, I'm like, oh, this is good. Mm -hmm. And yeah, basically I've been performing ever since. Although it wasn't until after college that I realized, hmm, maybe I should try to do this for a living. Well, you went to Yale. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty big accomplishment. Ah. Well. Pretty big accomplishment, I gotta say. Yale. <laughs> I went to Berkeley myself. Right on. I didn't even try for Yale. I figured they weren't gonna take well, it. Well, I think Berkeley might even be as hard to get into. Maybe. Maybe. Eh. You know, but Yale, Yale is dope. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, it's although it's funny because people go, "Oh, you went to Yale? Did you graduate?" It's like, <laughs> what is that supposed to mean? It's kind of racist, isn't right? it? Right. <laughs> right. It's like saying you're well spoken. Exactly. <laughs> so well spoken. <laughs> Think so well. <laughs> At what point did the acting gig start to come? Um, it took a minute. It took a minute. I remember I was, back, I was back home pursuing acting for, after the first year, I was ready to quit. Mm. I was like, yeah, this isn't working. You just weren't getting any gigs and you were yeah. starving. And <laughs> nope. I wasn't, not, I wasn't making any money. I wasn't getting anywhere. And I was just like, oh, okay. But then I stopped and asked myself, okay, but did you try your hardest? Did you do everything you could do? Yeah. I'm like, well, no, but, but I don't want to have to do that. That's hard. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. I, I, have, <laughs> I have actor friends that have been in L.A. for years. Mm -hmm. That would be half-assed working on a script. Right. Half-assed auditioning every so often. And they don't, get, they don't get anything. Right. And they're frustrated, but they're not really putting in the work. Exactly. It is not until you commit yourself. Yeah. I mean, every day I'm going to be doing yeah, this. Like, yeah. yeah. Nine out of ten times, you know, I've seen people, and if, you know, sometimes it, it is just a matter of time. You got to, you know, work, get your chops up, get better. But most of the time, that's a product of commitment. Like, mm -hmm. are you working? You know, are you any better than you were six months ago? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. If you don't know, then you haven't been trying. Was Pulp Fiction the first major gig? Um. Let's see that we shot that in ninety four um, or ninety three actually. Uh, no, well, it was the first gig of that level. I mean, and to this day, the only Oscar winning <laughs> movie I've ever been in. Okay. Um, but no, actually, by ninety two, I was making my living as an actor. Hmm. You know, Do and what? then uh, yeah, then that year like. You know, 92, I was just doing guest spots on comedies, TV shows, little movie stuff here and there. Um, and then it started to pick up, you know. I started to get known for like, oh, this kid is good. This kid can do stuff. Um, and then Pulp Fiction came along, although that was all part of the same process. I was uh, performing at the Groundlings and met Quentin Tarantino doing an improv show. Aha. Uh -huh. And he remembered me from that show. When he was cast in the movie. Oh, okay. So, and, and, I mean, at that point, Quentin Tarantino, Reservoir Dogs had come out right, already. Right. And it was cool. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a commercial success, no. from what I remember. It was like a, a critical success because it was kind of more of like a play than, right. than a traditional movie. It was right. all pretty right. much in one room. And, you know, I mean, yeah. And then, and from what I understand, before he, he was getting these these opportunities, he was working like at a video store. Right, right. He was broke. <laughs> right. Well, this, by this point, Quentin was out of the video store, but he, he was cool, but not famous. He yeah. had not blown up. Exactly. You know, because there's a lot of little indie movies like, oh, this is the darling of Sundance. 
You don't remember that dude's name. Yeah. You know? And Reservoir but, Dogs was one of those. Right. Reservoir Dogs, the, the difference was Quentin had all of these name actors that you knew in that movie. Like, yeah. How did that happen? And then you read his scripts and you realize why. Yeah. He, he was just so good. His writing was so tight that people of every level wanted to be a part of it. You know? Yeah. And that's what Pulp Fiction was. You know, it's like, hey, Bruce Willis, read this script. Oh, damn! Where do I sign up? <laughs> I mean, he had Bruce Willis, Uma Thurman, John Travolta, Sam Jackson, all for under $8 million. That's the crazy part. Like, even back in the 90s, you couldn't get all those people in a room for less than $8 million unless you had something they wanted to be a part of. Right. And John Travolta had kind of fallen off for a while. That that was his comeback. Well, you know, Saturday Night Fever was a long time ago. Right. But we forget, and I forgot at the time, how famous John used to be yeah super like, famous like we went out to lunch one time and it was me and quentin and sam jackson and john and you know like little honduran restaurant or something and the woman doesn't know who anybody is she doesn't know that sam jackson just had an award created for him at con so he's just like burrito you know and i'm you see it brings me my food quesadilla you know then she goes to john she goes john travolta <laughs> you know I'm like it's oh, physical. right. He, I mean, for a minute, he was one of the biggest stars in the world. 100%. And as soon as Pulp Fiction hit, it went back. Right, right back to it. You yeah. Know? And and Sam Jackson wasn't really that big back then. I felt that was his breakout role. Because yeah. he had done stuff before. Yeah. I, I mean, I, he, that's, he was that was the one that cemented him. Yeah. Where like, everyone's like, oh, that's the guy. Although people still got him confused with Lawrence Fishburne. Right, I yeah. Because I remember... Uh, I mean, when he was in Juice, I just right. interviewed uh, Khalil Kane, you know, from ah! Juice. And, oh, no way. Uh, yeah, I, I'd forgotten about Sam. You know, I'd, I rewatched the movie, and I'm like, oh, shit, Sam Jackson right. is in this. And he was in all the, he had small parts in all in those good early fellas, Spike Lee I think. movies. Yeah, Spike Lee, right. He yeah. played the DJ in right. Do the Right Thing. Right. right. He was just sort of like the little bit, bit role guy. But mm-hmm. then Pulp Fiction, he was one of the guys that stole the show. Exactly. So, okay, so you get cast mm-hmm. to be in Pulp Fiction. Right. Any idea what this is about to be? No. I knew it was going to be good. I didn't know it was going to be as successful. In fact, I remember joking with people on set. Like, well, I guess they could try to sell it as a big summer action movie. Bruce Willis, Uma Thurman, you know, (laughs) right up until the heroin overdose and the anal rape. (laughs) Shows you what I know, you know. See, this is... Right, yeah, because that movie did did kind of go real left a oh, few yeah. times. Yeah, the and the, it still made like hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Uma uh, Uma Thurman's uh, <laughs> right the yeah, overdose. Yeah, the, the heroin sniffing heroin, thinking it was oh, coke. Oh my god! And sticking the needle in her chest. Right. You gotta bring the needle down in a stabbing motion. I, I gotta I gotta stab her three times. No, you don't gotta fucking stab her three times. You gotta stab her once, but it's gotta be hard enough to get through her breastplate into her heart. All right, all right? and then once you do that, you pr- press down on the, the plunger. Okay, then what's ha- then what happens? Kind of curious about that myself. This ain't no fucking joke, man. Am I gonna oh, kill her? I mean, no, 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 she's supposed to come out of it like that. It's all right. Count to three. All right, ready? One. Two. Right, and then uh, the Gimp, who I guess was a friend of yours yes, in real life. That's my buddy Steve. <laughs> Steve is actually the reason I was in that movie. Hmm. Because he and his wife at the time, Julia Sweeney, were friends with Quentin, and they invited him to come to the Groundlings. Right. And that's, that was that, that whole nexus point. Right, and your role was kind of interesting. You got your head accidentally blown off. <laughs> what do you make of all this? Man, I don't even have an opinion. Well, you gotta have an opinion. I mean, do you think that God came down from heaven and stopped this? Oh, what the fuck's happening? Oh, oh man. Shit, man. Oh, man, I shot Marvin in the face. Why the fuck did you do that? Well, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Oh, man, I see some crazy-ass shit in my time, but just... Chill out, man. I told you it was an accident. You probably... 
he went over a bump or hey, something. Hey, the car ain't hit no motherfucking bump. Hey, look, man, I didn't, I didn't mean to shoot the son of a bitch. The gun went off. I don't know why. The weird thing about it is I cannot explain my role any less or any more than the guy who got his brains blown out in the back seat. Yeah. Because if, if you say the guy who got shot in Pulp Fiction, you're like, wait, which one? Which one, yeah. You know, you have to, I, but right. if I say the guy who got his brains blown out in the back of the car, people go, oh, <laughs> then they know. Right, yeah, because I remember there was that one line when uh, right. I guess John Travolta was trying to apologize and, <laughs> and, and, and like Samuel was like not taking his apology. In fact, what the fuck am I doing in the back? You the motherfuckers should be on brain detail. We fucking switching. I'm washing the windows and you picking up this nigga's skull. And he was like, you know, when a man apologizes, he's supposed to be instantly forgiven. He said, whoever made that rule was not scrubbing, scrubbing brain, brain off, the, off the backseat of a car. Matter of fact, why am I doing this shit? Why am I on brain detail? <laughs> right. No, that whole sequence, it's disgusting and hilarious. Right. Like, from start to finish. Um... What was supposed to be in that box in the in the suitcase? Was that uh, his soul? No, I asked him. I asked him on set. Tarantino. Yeah, it's like, dude, what's in the briefcase? And he said to me, his exact words were, "It's whatever you want it to be." <laughs> okay, there you go. And I'm like, wait, wait, is it what whatever I wanted to be or whatever? Who looks in the box? Like, character? What? Be? No. Okay, all right. Right, because you put 666, I think, as, right, uh, right, as the code. So you think it's the devil, it's a deal with the devil, it's a soul, <laughs> he sold his soul, there was like something on the back of his, you Oh, know, yeah, no, I had somebody come up to Ving me. Ving Rhames had something on the back of his... Uh, Ving Rhames cut his head shaven. Oh, that was that? Yes. There was no s symbolism? No. Oh, okay. No, see, that I, back in 97 or something, I had some college student come up to me like, no, I understand, but doing the whole right. his internet, soul comes out the back internet his conspiracy. It's like, dude, dude, come here. <laughs> some things are cool just because they're cool. Ving shaves his own head. He cut his head. When he came in to rehearse, Quentin saw the, the, the Band-Aid on the back of his head and said, hey, that looks pretty cool. Wait a minute. Instead of shooting you like a normal scene, why don't I shoot the whole thing from, from behind, behind you? Yeah. What did you think about Quentin Tarantino and the whole N-word thing? But you know what's on my mind right now? It ain't the coffee in my kitchen. It's the dead nigger in my garage. Oh, Jimmy, don't even worry well, no, about no, 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 don't think about anything. I'm gonna ask you a question. When you came pulling in here, did you notice a sign on the front of my house that said dead nigger storage? Jimmy, you know I ain't seen no shit. Did you notice a sign in the front of my house that said dead nigger storage? No, I didn't. You know why you didn't see that sign? Why? Because it ain't there, because storing dead niggers ain't my fucking business. That's why. Because um, I, I remember, from what I heard, Denzel Washington approached Quentin mm -hmm. and cussed him out over that. Mm. I mean, I don't, to me, it's not about a word. It's about an intention. You know, I've heard people say, colored with way more, you know, anger, nastiness, and hatred than Quentin has ever said the N-word with, you know? And to me, in that context and in that script, and in most of his scripts, the context is very clear, and the intention is very clear, you know? Um, and the idea is supposed to be his character, Jimmy, is a buddy of Jules. That's Jules' buddy. And we all know, for better or for worse, there's some white dudes who got black friends who said that it was okay. Now, for those of us who are not their friends, it's not okay, but, you know, he was one of those dudes. Right, and Quentin's character also had a black wife. Right. I remember that was sort of, uh, yeah, I almost felt Vanessa. like that was kind of done on purpose to kind of counter some mm -hmm. of that. No, no, it wasn't to counter it. It was, that was the creation of, that's that, that character. Was the creation, right. He's that, he's that white guy who thinks he's down. <laughs> okay, right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to me, what, what happens, where it becomes problematic is if you are not creating a full character and a full context for something like that. Yeah. And it's just an excuse for a writer to say the word. Yeah. You know, or an actor to say, or if an, an actor just improvised it, you know. Right. I mean, because from what I understand, I think I, I remember reading a Samuel Jackson interview and he said that Quentin's not racist, but he really likes you know, like the black exploitation films right. that were coming out in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And he tried to get Pulp Fiction to kind of have that type of feel. And in those movies, the N-word was being thrown out right. 
by everybody, white, black, right, right, Mexican, and it didn't matter. Like, it was a whole thing. Well, listen, hell of a movie, right? Hell of a movie. Man. Pulp Fiction is still. Uh, I mean, you could still watch it today and still. I know. Still enjoy it just as much. You know, it's always weird though, because you know, talk to people in their twenties who watch it and they dig it, but I'm like, oh, you don't understand. Like, for those of us who watched it in '95, yeah, in the theaters, it changed. Like. There, before Pulp Fiction, there weren't movies like Pulp Fiction. Yeah, I agree. Since then, there's a whole lot of them. Right. But, like, to have something that just, you know, changed movies like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean it'd be interesting how many of those scenes Quinn had to fight for, you know, with the... Because this was a major film. Right, This was right. not an indie film. This was... No, no, it was, it was indie. It was indie? It was Miramax. It was not uh, released, and it was before they were bought by Disney. So it was not released through any major Miramax studio. Miramax wasn't a major company back then? They were a big company. Okay, they, that's what I'm saying. But they were, they were, they were not Paramount, okay, Fox. Okay, f- fair enough. You know, they, didn't, enough. Have, they didn't own no theaters. Okay. You know, I mean, that's why it was so surprising mm. that, I mean, it was released by the same people who released Reservoir, Reservoir Dogs. Okay. You know, but it blew up. I mean, yeah. One, you had much bigger stars. Yeah. You know, and the timing was just right. Yeah, I mean, even Harvey Keitel was in it, and he, right, right. he had a, a storied well, history. Harvey was the big name on Reservoir Dogs. He was the low name on <laughs> yeah, Pulp Fiction. On Pulp Fiction, yeah. You know, he was the cameo. He was the cameo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, was it? Yeah, yeah. the wolf. Yeah. Oh, that's all you had to say, man. <laughs> you know. He said, pretty pleased with sugar on top. Is that, is that better? Right. <laughs> and everybody in it was so good. Everyone nailed it. You know? Everyone nailed it. I got to say, there wasn't one bad performance. Right, that, right. Like. And all different. You know, like Bruce Willis was doing something completely different than Sam, you know. But he was good. He was good. 